Okay, we're gonna get started. Uh, good morning, everybody. I just, um, yeah, just a little background on this. I was at the uh, Burns Voigt workshop in Boston this past week. Um, it was a pretty good workshop. There was definitely some learning moments. I, I got, you know, a page of, of jotted down quick notes, which means I did take away quite a bit from it. I'm not a person that takes detailed notes. It's just like, I just want a bullet point. So I feel like I, I got some great things out of it. And some of those things I wanted to share with you this morning. Um, and some of them I, 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 you know, I had feelings about in the past and, and uh, have made an effort to do them, but I think some of them really stuck out in my mind and I wanted to share them with you, um, hopefully so that you can make them part of your training program. Um, and the first thing I'm gonna talk about this morning is Monitoring stress levels, essentially. And um, my experience over the years has, has taught me that if I don't do a good job of that, I can potentially lose the dog and it can cause me months of rehab to try and get an attitude or work ethic um, <clears throat> or confidence back into the dog so that I can continue training. If I, and my experience has told me, if I don't monitor this stuff and I get into one of those holes, um, it can be, it can really be career limiting. And these things happen, they're subtle things that happen that we don't always see if we're not really paying attention. So I'm gonna outline some of the things that I think will help you pay attention to um, your dog's attitude and your dog's stress level um, and hopefully prevent you from getting into the holes that I've gotten into in the past. So um, uh, where I'd like to start with this is give you some visual reference to help you maybe understand what I'm getting at. And, and so I've, I've out outlined three categories, green, orange, and red. Green being everything's good. Orange means it's time to, it's time to start being cautious. Red, you, you better stop. You're, you're, getting it, you're getting yourself into trouble. And there are a few areas that we need to monitor and category, or sorry, monitor and give each one of those things a rating as we're training our dogs. Um, I would say the first one I'm going to mention is the level of difficulty of the test. You guys have been with me long enough that you know if you're doing a wide open triple with no factors, that's a pretty straightforward test. That's a test that tends to help our dogs relax and build up confidence. And so I would rate that, uh, I should have given myself a little more room here, but I would rate that in the green area. You know, I'm not, typically, I'm not creating any stress when I'm doing those things. Or if I'm doing walking singles, I'm not doing anything that's creating any stress. Um, that, that are, those are some examples of tests that don't create any stress. Um, an example of a test that would be getting into the orange category would be, um, let's say, uh, a water set of watermarks and one of those watermarks contains a fairly lengthy swim with a daunting look you know if you look at the pond that you're training on not every pond is created equally um, even though the distances to the marks might be similar the appearance of the piece of water that you're using it may be a big piece of water with a rather small test but if you're looking out toward that water that can be very intimidating or if you're doing a, a watermark with a big swim, uh, let's say 300 plus yards, um, and the dog is backed up from the water, and uh, that can be very stressful. And so you're, you're getting into the orange category here in terms of level of difficulty. Or another example of something that might be getting you into the orange category is a test with a, a complex, um, a complex uh, 
concept. We're going to get into one of those later on. Hopefully we'll have time to, to dip into one of the tests we did at the workshop. I think there's a lot of learning uh, that can be had from it. So for instance, a mama papa can be very stressful or a very difficult check down bird where the marks are very tight. I would throw that into the orange category. Um, I think if, if I'm talking about the red category, uh, that would be you having run a test with your dog that was inappropriate because the dog wasn't adequately prepared for it. And the dog um, was, it was evident that the dog was in over its head and now you're, you're into the red area. Um, and, and so again, make a note of it. Anyways. So level of difficulty, does anybody have any questions so far? Okay, so the next area that we're going to monitor is, um, let's say, uh, we're, we'll call it uh, correction and, we'll call it correction and training. Training. I think most of you know when I say, today we went out and trained, it wasn't just that we went out and ran a test. It was that the dogs were challenged to a level that caused them to fall into traps. And uh, there was perhaps some handling uh, in the situation. And that, that in itself can cause a dog to become stressed. If a dog is doing a particular concept, again, I'll use the mama papa, for example. Um, let's say the dog switches and returns to the old fall or the dog takes off from the line going toward the, the wrong mark of the mama papa and there are several pickups, that training in itself will cause a degree of stress. So if your dog didn't, didn't, um, if your dog didn't fall into any traps, well, we're in the green category again, perhaps. If the dog fell into some of the traps, but was able to be led out of the trap rather easily, we're probably in the orange category. If we're um, talking about a dog that fell into traps and it was a complete mess, um, that could be getting you into the red category. Again, you asked the dog to do something it wasn't prepared for. Um, you, you are, again, you're, you're probably getting into the red category. So make a note of that. If I'm speaking too fast, just stop me if you're trying to take notes. We also, so that was talking about training. Now let's talk about correction. Let's say the dog falls into a trap and there may be several corrections. For instance, you're running a double blind with a poison bird and it's complex. Um, and uh, your dog perhaps tries to pick up the poison bird or is naughty about stopping crisply on whistles. And now you're assessing the dog corrections for the, those things. You're getting again into the uh, orange, orange area. So again, make a note about that. Correction and training, level of difficulty and the amount of correction that happened there. Okay, and I think, at least at this point, because this is relatively new for me, trying to put this into boxes for you to help you understand. But the last area that I feel you have to monitor, uh, and it requires you as a handler and a trainer to be very observant. When, you know, right from the time you leave for training or you load the dogs up or you get the dogs out of the vehicle or you get into the holding blind or you're sitting on the mat <clears throat> with your dog. You have to be, you have to look at your dog's body language and read how your dog is feeling today when you go out and train. Is your dog excited and um, perhaps a little undisciplined, um, getting out of the car and going to the holding blind or in the holding blind, they're kind of whining and, and you can tell they're ready to go. Well, they're, they're probably in the green category again. I don't, I don't think that they're feeling all that bad. But if you get your dog out of the vehicle or open the door to the vehicle and they're very cautious about getting out of the vehicle, 
that's telling you something. That's telling you how they feel. And that's what we're really trying to dial into here in this last court category. Is how does your dog feel today? If you get into the holding blind, they haven't even seen the test yet and their ears are pinned back and their head may be down and their tail is not wagging, they're stressed. They may even be here. I don't know where they are, but you've got to, you know, every dog is an individual. You have to assess, is this what my dog is typically like? Or is this something new? Um, is this something out of the ordinary? And, and so you may be getting into the red area and make a mental note of that, that, that things are not, your dog is not looking as confident as you would like it to. Another um, example of a dog that's looking stressed is you get up to the line and the dog uh, kind of picks out one of the gun stations, one of the more difficult gun stations, but just refuses to stay locked on it. And they're fascinated with some other mark. Now, sometimes it's just that that short mark is exciting. Other times it looks like, um, other times you can tell that the dog that just doesn't want to walk that bird at that gun station because they feel stressed about it. You know, for lack of a better term, they're pooping razor blades because they know that there's a potential for a lot of trouble and maybe they've gotten into a lot of trouble recently. And so it's led them to feel a real lack of confidence in this particular situation that you've presented them with today or uh, stress that's built up over time. And if you're getting to this point, you're in, you're, you're probably in the red zone and, and you better start thinking about, you know, is this a general theme that you're seeing in your dog or is it, is it caused just in particular training situations? Um, you need to sort of figure that out in your mind and be monitoring that things that will help you determine where you're going from here. Hoping I've covered everything so far. Are there any questions so far? Okay. Now let's talk about how you move forward at, or once you've evaluated this stuff and you've, and you've recognized the things that are happening, what, what do you do? How do you prevent yourself from getting to that stage where your dog is, is, very much in this area here, the red area. Um, I think what I would try to do, number one is, you know, if I'm recognizing that my dog is all balled up or they're, they're just, they're, there's a lot of anxiety uh, going to the holding blind and coming to line and picking out those birds, I, I definitely know that it's time to back off. It's time to move to things that, you know, the, the type of test in the green area. And if it's a particular situation that's causing the stress, like a look down a big pond, or you're just running blinds, but you're seeing this, you can see the stress um, building in your dog, you need to do things in those particular arenas that are going to help your dog's confidence and, uh, return. So it may be instead of doing a difficult um, double land blind with a poison bird, you move back to, well, let's just do several shorter land blinds that are wide open, no factors and no concepts and run two or three of those tests to bring the confidence back. Hopefully you haven't gotten to that point where your dog is so far down the rabbit hole, it's going to take you six months to, to overcome the problem. Um, and I, I guess at this point, I'd like to state that most people feel that it's a lack of effort on their dog's part at this stage, that they're not putting effort forward to try to do the test, when in reality, most times, it is you've been doing the wrong training. You didn't have a balanced training plan. And uh, if you uh, think that it's uh, a lack of effort, you're probably, and, it, and it's not a lack of effort, it's a lack of confidence, you're gonna to get to that place where it's gonna take you six months or maybe even a lifetime to rehab or manage. So don't let yourself get there. <clears throat> um, and and that's, that, that's, that's sort of, 
like I said, I'd like to say another thing too. If when you're monitoring the difficulty level of the tests you're doing, if you do several tests in a row, let's say two or three tests in a row, probably the number's closer to two, you better think about doing something that's easy. Don't just, don't just monitor your dog's body language. Remember, there are three categories here we're monitoring. Body language, uh, the level of dif difficulty of the test, and the, the amount of correction and, and trouble that the dog is finding when they, they're running these tests. So if we talk about those last two categories, the level of difficulty in the test and the amount of correction, um, and you find your dog has been faced with tests that are difficult, then you need to back off after two or three tests. You need to say, I've done some training, quote unquote training. Now it's time to make sure I'm maintaining a positive attitude, a confident attitude, so that my dog feels that it can get these tests done. Any questions so far? Kelly, would you like to chime in? I know we've talked about this and Kelsey, we've talked about this. I don't know if we've talked, if I've talked to you in person about some things that maybe I haven't met here to bring up. I just froze you, Kevin. Are you frozen? No. Are you there? Okay. I'm here. Yep. Okay. So we, we, you and I talked briefly about it over the um, weekend when it was fresh in your mind from coming off the seminar that you attended. And um, first of all, thank you for having us all today because this makes a lot of clarification from what you and I talked about on the phone. Um, but definitely when I trained yesterday, uh, not only did I see it, not only was I much more observant in my dog, but I, I quickly saw it in other people's other people's dogs as well. And when we're in our training groups, um, I think it's super important because when you're at the line with your dog, somebody standing off to the side it is going to see things different. So with Karen and I yesterday, when Rody uh, didn't go for the long bird and I was standing off to the side watching it and I'm like, Ooh, Karen, what do you think of us rethrowing it? I was completely um watching Rody's body language and I, I i don't think i would have done that two weeks ago that's that's great i'm i'm glad to hear that um any anybody else kelsey do you have any comments yeah um a lot of comments and um this is so relevant because i see it in my dog now i just had a really cool opportunity to go south for a couple of weeks and i had two weeks of training really hard and trialing really hard. And so I think, you know, my dog held it together better than he should, but I, I, at the end of those two weeks after doing probably too much every day, you can just see all the signs that you're talking about. You know, he just, he was a little anxious going into the holding line and into the line and it really affected how we did those tests. So, um, I just like Kelly mentioned, I've seen people that get in real trouble with their dogs and training groups and folks that have almost and maybe ruined dogs. And I know that they didn't do anything intentional to do it, but I could see how training my dog like this day in and day out um, could get us to a point where, you know, we can almost not recover. So, um, no, this is really, it's a really, really a great reminder to, to balance stuff out. Cool. Cool. I agree. Um, does anybody else that's listening have any questions about, about anything I've talked about or need clarification on anything? And, and it's so easy from a, you know, for us, you, you know, I, I know you guys love to train. You guys are passionate about training. You love to get out there every day and you don't feel like you're accomplishing anything unless you're training. And that's the problem right there is uh, that I hope I'm going to try to alleviate is the fact that, you know, some days it's important not to go out and train, just go out and let your dog do some things that are relaxing or that are restorative, if that's a good word to use. Um, so make sure you're doing that. All yeah, right, I, I'm, yeah. I, I, you said it, you took it. I was just fixed, I just unmuted to just to, to say that is, um, uh, you, us, I, I know most of us here, 
and um, we want to push. We, we want to push ahead and we want to push hard and, and we want to move forward. And um, you got to, you have to help us and continue to remind me um, of why that's not going to work. And we need to have this system in place so that we don't go red often ever. Yeah. 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 We're going to end up, we're going to get there occasionally, but what I'm ho hoping is that you'll recognize it soon enough that you're, that you don't get yourself into a hole. And, and yes, I will remind you. And I keep saying to people that I'm working with, you guys have heard me say it balance. You need balance. Stop doing, stop hyper-focusing on something that you're trying to perfect. Um, it can be very dangerous to set goals. And what I mean by that is I get some of you thinking, I can't stop focusing on this particular concept or training until I perfect it. And that's the big mistake right there. It's like, you just want to give them a small dose of something and then move on to some other things so that you're, you don't get the dog worried about that situation because if you're hyper focusing on it, it means your dog's not doing very well at it and if they're not doing very well at it and they keep coming out day after day after day not doing very well you're you're heading to you're going to crash your dog's going to crash okay i want to talk about um a couple of other topics we have time somebody else have a question oh, okay. sue here i know you oh, sue? especially with my young dog training remember you kept saying to me you know move on move on don't you know, perfect it. So. Yeah, it's very easy, uh, especially during the basics. I mean, it's much more obvious during the basics when, you know, another easy example for me is the person that starts a lesson and says, I can't finish the lesson until the dog gets to this point, till the dog does this. That's such a huge mistake. You know, it's like, I keep telling people that I'm working through the basics with, You've got five to seven minutes. I don't care where you at after where you're at after that five to seven minutes, but you better be looking for your exit strategy. I think that's a good point. Board still pretty visible. Good. Okay. The next thing I'd like everybody to do, I sent everybody a text message uh, with a test diagram. And it's a test from the, the Lardy workshop. Um, I'm gonna draw some of it out here on the board. And we're going to discuss it because I think it really speaks to the art of dog training as opposed to just the science of dog training. And that's, that's what I went to this workshop for. I can, I can read the textbook to you and tell you what to do for the most part. But when, you, um, when you're faced with complex situations, you're no longer looking at a textbook you're diving into the art of dog training. And that's where I'm trying to get you guys. And I have to say that, you know, these, you people that I work with every day or on a very regular basis, I'm so proud of how you guys are, have developed over time. That to me is just huge uh, where you've come from and where you are today. And most of you, I haven't worked with very long. I mean, most of you are kind of around the year mark at the most. So um, again, I'm just so proud of you guys. Um, let me pull this test up here. So this is a four bird test. There's certainly a lot of training in it. Um, the only portion of the test that I want to talk about is uh, marks number two and three. I'm not going to spend much time talking about one and four. I think those are very straightforward concepts. One is simply a cheating single. The dogs that were undisciplined would run down the levee or they would jump in wide and jump over to that peninsula that comes out from the left side of the test. So that, that was just very straightforward textbook training. Number four, again, was it was a punch bird, obviously, um, but the dogs did have to angle those uh, peninsulas as they exited. Uh, I think there were three shoreline exits and all of them had a bit of an angle to them and a, an undisciplined dog would square to the right. Very straightforward. So let's get to the, the real 
test that I'm trying to draw, uh, trying to talk about here. And that's mark number two and three. They're not quite a mama papa, but they're verging on that of mama. So just allow me to draw out the test here for discussion purposes. Let's do this here. So F or number two was a flyer. It was thrown angle back out into the water and which is number two and then three was a dead bird that was thrown across a gap of water to a little point that came out from the peninsula they were stand up they weren't weren't retired but in reality you could retire number three or in a you know if this was a field trial situation you could retire two and three if you really wanted to make it difficult okay so i just want to draw in some of the landscape here too start here Bear with me. I think this is what it's like. Okay. All right. And this, I would say there was probably like, I don't know, Kelsey, you, you might remember better than me, but I, I'd say there was like a 20, 25 yard entry into the water on those marks. Yep. Yep. Uh, the others, I need to draw in some more of the landscape here, actually, to help you understand a little bit more. So. Okay. All right. So the distances, I think everybody can see was a hundred yards. Well, you can't see uh, what number three was, but it was a hundred yards to, to the flyer. And it was probably, I'm gonna say 120 to 125 to this mark. Would that be right, Kelsey? Yes, there was not much difference between them. Not much difference. It was. Literally, it felt like a mama papa to me almost, especially because this bird was angled back a little bit, the flyer was angled back. So let's talk about why this mark was so complex first. The flyer was very straightforward, other than I think the potential was here for the dogs to cheat, but they didn't. So we're not even gonna, we're, we're not even gonna acknowledge that. But this mark here, the longer of the two was complex because there was an opportunity for the dogs to cheat on the re-entry. It was complex because there was a flyer station here, which was very attractive. There was a down the shore component to the mark and it was thrown across a piece of water. It was an island bird or a bridge bird as some people like to call them. Um, it was complex because there was the opportunity for the dogs to square out over here. It was complex because in my mind, when I looked at this test from the line, these, there were two people at the flyer station, Just put some X's here, and there was one person at that station. And when you looked at that test to me, it looked like a very messy flyer station, three gunners at the same station almost. It didn't look as though those were two separate stations. So you can see all the complexity to this, but what, what I really wanna talk about is how to handle a situation like this. You're the person online, you've picked up the flyer. This was thrown as a double, by the way. 
Bridgebird one, flyer two. You picked up the flyer and now you're going to try to get the bridge bird. And there's a lot of things going through your mind. You're thinking, well, I really don't want them to cheat on the spit. I really don't want them thinking about going back to the flyer. I really want to push them out so that they get to the, uh, get to the mark as opposed to go to the gun on the bridge bird. Um, and so there's a lot of things going through your mind. Kelsey ran this test, by the way. And Kelsey, if you want to pipe up at any time to tell us about, you know, the things that were going through your mind. Um, the, with all of those things going through your mind as a handler, it's complex in how you communicate with your dog in, ter in trying to get them to do all of these things right. So I'll tell you some of the things that happened. There were some people that felt they needed to push on, when they sent for this mark here, they felt they needed to push more to the right. They needed to push more to the right in order to avoid having a dog cheat or to communicate that the bird was thrown across the gap. But a lot of those people, when they started pushing, would push their, do their dog to looking outside of the mark, somewhere over here. And what they were effectively doing in that moment when they did that was they were telling the dogs, don't go to that destination. Don't get to that bird. And Kelsey will tell you that plenty of dogs said, I'm not going there. I'm just going to keep going. And that was their intention. They, had, they said, it's safer not to go there because that's what my, sorry, I shouldn't say it's safer not to go there. I should say, I'm not going to go there because my handler told me not to go there. That would be a more uh, really telling you what was happening in that situation. Um, the second thing that made this so complex and that I want to talk about and how people handle that situation was the fact that there was a flyer here and that people got nervous about the fact there was a flyer there and they saw the potential for the dog to go back to the old fall or back to the flyer. And so I think that too caused people to push their dog away from this mark, which ended up causing dogs to go long. The other thing when we start talking about it, even though most people would say this isn't a mom and papa, but it is, it looked like one gun station. A dog could perceive it as one gun station. So it had the, the feel of a mom and papa to me. And it's a difficult concept for a dog to achieve doing correctly, because the first concept the dog learns when we're going through the basics and through the transition period of training and we get into conceptual marking training, the first concept they learn is not to return to an old fall. You've done it. I've asked you to set up punch birds, set up the staggered triple, run the middle distance bird first, then do a double. And if the dog goes back to the old fall when it's going out to the long bird, stop and handle the dog. And so we drive that concept home. It's the first concept they're going to learn. When a dog looks at this situation and sees that this looks like one gun station, even though it's technically two, the dog says, I've been taught not to go there. So if you get real pushy, if you get real pushy trying to avoid a cheat and going back to the old fall and trying to get them to go land on the location where the bridge bird is, that's what you're going to get out of this test. The dog is going to say, I read you loud and clear, boss. I'm not going back to the old fall. I'm simply going to take the line you wanted me to go on and, and I'll just keep going for you. And by the way, the dogs didn't know that the long bird was out there because we did that last as a single. Yet dog after dog after dog did this. Simply because the handlers were not skilled in communicating to their dog exactly what they wanted them to do. I'm going to talk a little bit about how I feel you need to communicate with your dog when you're trying to get this bird in a complex situation. And then I'm going to talk about the, a variety of things that can go wrong. When you do everything right, there's a variety of things that can go wrong and how to react to them. Okay, so um, in terms of communicating with your dog online, and I have to say that Kelsey did a fabulous job up there online with her dog. I mean, I could just see uh, 
you know, Kelsey couldn't see it, but Ray and, and um, Pat were standing behind Kelsey, watching her prepare a dog to send for a mark. And Kelsey did everything right. And those two just looked at each other and nodded in like, wow, that was pretty cool because they watched person after person come up and screw it up. So um, Kelsey, kudos to you. Um, when you are preparing to send for this mark, you have to rely on your dog's training to, to stick. You know, you before you get here, obviously the dog has to have done many cheating singles to understand that cheating is not an option. And I'm not saying even a trained dog won't cheat here, but your first job, you know, th there's so many components to this mark and you want to make sure you're training on each individual component at the right time. The first component is, you know, teaching them not to cheat. If they don't cheat here, you're, you've got part of the battle won. So I'm, the reason why I bring that point up, if I feel I've trained my dog to do this correctly, in other words, get in the water correctly where it could potentially cheat, I'm not going to push the dog way out to the right. I'm going to allow the dog to make decisions all on its own. And if it makes a wrong decision, will it deal with it? But I'm not going to force my dog out. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to push my dog way out to the right in order to avoid a potential cheat. I'm going to see this as an opportunity to do a little training. And it, it, to some degree, it's actually testing as opposed to training here. But um, so don't force your dog outside because of this. Um, the same thing about the flyer station. You've done the concept, don't return to the old fall. You know, and I, now let's break this down a little bit. These are two separate gun stations in reality, even though they might look like one. But as a trainer, I have to rely on the fact that I have taught my dog that first concept, don't return to an old fall. I'm not gonna push my dog way out to the right in order to avoid the potential disaster of the dog going back to the old fall. If the dog goes back to the old fall in training, they fell in, they made the decision all on their own. Let them do it. Okay. Now, now I want to talk about, now that you understand those two points that I made about cheating and potentially going back to the old fall, that we're not going to fear those two things. The next thing to talk about is how do I communicate that this is the next destination to go to? And my rule in that situation is start at the gunner. Start by pointing the dog at the gunner. When you do that, that says to your dog, that's the next destination. They go, okay, I get it. That's where I'm going next. There's no confusion. We're not telling them the line to the mark. We're simply telling them in that moment what the destination is. And then for those of you that have very refined handling skills and you develop very fine handling skills by doing Sue's W drill and some other very tight lining drills. If you, and, and I would also say that, you know, we do the Ontario 10 step and some other things to help teach the dog to nudge out to the bird. If your handling skills are that refined and you've taught your dog to do that, you want to start to influence a little. Maybe it's just a little lift of one leg or maybe just a gentle step forward. And sometimes you're gonna get the little click over to the bird, sometimes you're not, but it takes a lot of discipline on your part to work hard to get the look you need. Now, the danger when you push is that the dog looks over here somewhere. And this is where handlers screwed up. They might pull the dog back in a little bit, so now the dog is looking here, but when you push the dog out here, the first thing you communicate to that dog, don't go to this destination. So if your dog does that, if your dog looks over here, your job is now to pull the dog right back to the gunner. You don't, you don't work, and I, you, some of you have heard me say this, you don't work from the outside in. I'm gonna erase some of the mess here because I'm gonna tell you what that means. The big mistake that I see handlers make time and time again is they, the dog comes in and sits down and is looking, instead of looking at the mark or at the destination, 
the dog is looking in this direction. That's their first look out to the right. And those people try and work their dog to the bird, not the gun station. They try to work their dog to the bird. So now they might get a look like this. The problem with that is the dog is just looking at a line to, be, to go on. They're not thinking what destination they're going to. If you send your dog by just pulling the dog from this line to this line, your dog's gonna, just going to do this. Say bye-bye, you're done. Pick up, go back to the truck, go home that weekend. If your dog starts by looking outside the mark, I'm going to erase some of the mess. Your job is then to pull the dog, pull where the dog is looking, all the way to the gunner. So they're looking at the gunner. Now you've said, no, I don't want you to swim to the end of the pond. I don't want you to go to go on some line and keep going until you, you know, hit a wall. I want you to go to this destination. And the dog will go, oh, that destination. Um, and then once you've got them looking at the destination, start working back to the bird, nudge them out to the bird. You might have to go through that process several times before the dog goes, I get it now. That's what you want. You want. And you guys have to have the patience to do that. And I know it's hard. I'm not, I'm, I'm equally guilty. I've done it myself. I've made the mistake many times and wish I could have another go at it. But force yourself to block out all the white noise behind you and the judges and the gallery that's watching it. Just let it be you and your dog up there. And take the time to be very disciplined about communicating things that you need to be communicating in order to get that mark. Do your job. You expect your dog to do their job. This is your job here on the line. And all too often, I see trainers blame the dog for making mistakes in these complex situations. And I'm standing behind going, wow, that was all you. That was all you, not the dog take responsibility for it. Okay. Are there any questions so far before I keep going? I'm trying to get this in before we've got 15 more minutes. So no question. Kevin. Now, yeah, go ahead. Um, I just figured out how to get my mic to work. This was on the earlier areas we were discussing about, about pressure and, and uh, keeping your dog happy. So let's say you're doing a complex mark, and let's say it's a poison bird, and your can we, dog. Can we can we hold off for a second on that? Because I don't sure. want to lose people's train of thought. But if you hold on to that question, because it's from the last topic we talked about, we'll come okay. back to it at the end. Okay, I don't mind okay. staying late, and anybody okay. else that wants to go is fine. <clears throat> okay. So now you've done your job. Mm -hmm. Uh, now you've done your job to point your dog to, sorry, let me, let me start over. Now you've done your job to communicate what the right destination is and what kind of line you'd like. And sometimes you can't get them to look out at the bird. And maybe you're better off sending them looking at the gunner. I mean, it might not be pretty. They might run, to, if this is a field trial situation or a hunt test situation, they might run down here, jump in and go get the bird. But at least they got the bird and you're not handling it and you're simply charged with a cheating infraction. That's way better than pushing the dog out here, having to stop and handle back to the bird. Now you're, now you're no better than green, and maybe, maybe not even that. And if you're real lucky, the dog gets in, you know, makes the re-entry and swims to the bird and has a little hunt and gets the bird, and now you're potentially getting blue. But you gotta do your job. Okay, so now let's talk about, you know, it's training day, and how do we deal with all of the things that can go wrong, because again, this speaks to the art of dog training. This is a real mess. Just a little bit. Okay. 
what's the first concept a dog learns? It's not to go back to an old fall. Why do they not go back to the old fall? Because some, they know that sometimes there's a consequence for going back to an old fall. You know, if, if you're doing a punch bird and the dog uh, is going past the middle distance bird, which is a flyer, and, you know, it's not a first whistle correction, but maybe on the second whistle, if I don't get the right response from the dog, I might correct in a dip, not in this situation, but a different situation where I'm working on a punch bird and the dog, you know, tries to go back to the flyer and second or third whistle, I'm saying, listen, I told you two or three times not to go there. Now I'm going to, now you're going to be assessed a correction and I'm going to cast you out of there. So that what sticks in that dog's mind at that point is if I go back to the old fall, I'm going to get corrected. But in a punch bird scenario, the lessons are very clear because there's a, typically 70 or more yards between the middle distance mark and the punch bird mark. And I'll just draw something out here. 70, or sorry. So we got a mark here and a mark here, and this one's a flyer, and there's at least 70 yards between them. It isn't 20 to 25. This is complex. That is not complex. The dog knows, yeah, I just didn't. I just decided to go back to the flyer station because it was so exciting. So it's a clear learning, clear uh, learning moment. And that's what the dog takes away from this conceptual training. But they carry it to this conceptual training now and they go, I, I, I really feel uncomfortable about going back there because I, or, sorry, not going back there because you're not going back there, but I really feel uncomfortable about going here because I know that if I, go there, there's the potential to get into trouble because I feel like I'm going back to the old fall. I'm going to try and remember where I was going with this. Oh, yeah. So what the reason why I point that out is to say to you, this is a very delicate situation. And how you react to the mistakes that your dog makes can really either help your cause or completely screw it up. So if the dog makes any mistakes in this test, you better react with caution as opposed to, uh, oh, this is textbook number five. He's going back to the old fall, and so I'm going to stop, correct, and handle. Or, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spank him good because he's going back, to the, going back to the flyer. Or he cheated, and so therefore I'm going to stop and spank him good because he cheated. And so you, you made that correction, and now the dog, you know, because the dog went here, different color the dog was climbed up on the spit and then said i'm going to run down and you stop the dog and you spanked him good and then you handled him into the water for the cheat um sure uh, the textbook says if your dog cheats first whistle correction however you might get get the dog not to cheat again but they may also take away from that correction I had no business going back there. I was returning back to the old fall. I'll never make that mistake again. Are you, I hope everybody followed that. I, and this is where, you know, inexperienced trainers screw up. They see this. They say, cheat. I'm going to correct my dog, spank him good, make sure they know never to cheat again. But the problem with that is you can't sit down and reason with your dog and have a discussion after and say, listen now, Bubba. Um, you were supposed to get in the water, and that's clearly why I corrected you. Your dog, you can't do that with your dog. So if you make that correction, the consequence of that could be the dog doesn't read it as a correction for cheating. They read it as a correction for returning to the old fall. And now you can never get this done. You can never get this concept done. So if your dog cheats, first whistle, just a handle. It's a, it's a very complex situation. Remember, you might have even had to send them up a gunner. So you're inviting them to run down the spit. All you want to do is stop and handle and say, mm, that's not an option. If they don't give you the first cast, maybe use a little attrition. Or if you think they're being real naughty, then perhaps you make a correction, but you make sure it's really low. It's on the low end of the scale. So a little tickle. But remember, you're getting into that area where you can get yourself into a lot of trouble. The next thing that could happen is the dog is swimming down the shore. Dog is swimming down the shore and they try to get out early. And we had dogs do that. And, you know, that's usually a first whistle correction 
or, or can be a first whistle correction. But in this situation, the same rules apply. I'm not going to correct my dog because I don't want that dog to think it's not allowed to go back to the old fall. Or sorry, I don't want my dog to think that it's potentially going back to the old fall, even though that's not what it's doing. And uh, so stop and handle. Maybe stop and handle again. You might have to stop and handle two or three times without correcting. Or again, if you do feel like, eh, I really, you know, this dog's being really undisciplined, I think I should make a correction here. Make sure it's low level. It's on the lower end of the scale. Okay. The next, any questions so far? Oh, must be doing a good job of explaining. Um, <laughs> the next thing that can happen is the dog arrives at the fall area. Remember, we've got our gunner, our gunner standing here and starts to put on a hunt and then goes over to the gunner. And I'm going to bring this up because I think that people feel that the dog is making an error when it does that. In reality, they're not. I mean, think of, think of a dog that is out in the field and, you know, runs over to the gun to kind of check it out and then goes back to the bird. We would never assess you know, that, that the dog is doing something wrong in that situation. And the same is here. So we've got to allow the dog some latitude to problem solve, to figure out where the bird actually is. So if they get up there, you know, I'm just going to allow them to hunt. I may even allow them to jump in the water over here. They are not at this point making any decisions to return to the flyer. They're simply trying to come up with it. Up with it. Now, if they spend a lot of time up here and they look across and look at that point many times, but say, you know what, I just don't feel like getting back in the water to make that swim over there. I may stop and handle the dog after I feel I've given them ample time and they've shown me that they kind of know where the bird is, but they're not willing to jump in the water to go look for it. I would probably handle, but I would not correct. I would not correct. I would not correct. And I'd probably just handle them into the water and once they're in the water, let them continue to work it out. I'm not handling right to the bird at that point. I'm just saying, go look for the bird. Go look for the bird in the water. Stop not looking in the water, essentially. And hey, so Kevin, I got a question. The... Yep. Would you, so um, uh, would you ever, in this situation, use gunner help to redirect them to get there? So let's just say the dog goes behind the gun, is in that other piece of water, kind of stays behind the gun a little bit. Um, it, as opposed to stopping the handling, would there be a situation where you'd use gunner help with that? Yeah, if I thought that the dog was, had made a good effort, you know, if they're hunting, if, they're get, if they get up on the spit and just go round and round and round and round and round, that's not an effort to go look for the bird. But if the dog was in here hunting and then came up here and hunted and then jumped over here and hunted, well, they're in the water hunting. They just clearly are not quite sure where the bird is. And in this situation, if it looked like it was starting to deteriorate, like the dog has made a good effort at this point, but maybe they started to work in, or maybe they're just, they've really tried hard and they're not getting it. Yeah, I'm going to have the gunner stand up, holler at the dog, step, motion with an arm swing to try and give that dog some information that's going to help them a little to problem solve. I won't handle the dog in this situation if I, if I can avoid it. The, another thing that can happen is the dog, mess here again. The dog uh, gets here, kind of comes up here and then looks like it's returning to the flyer fall and has made no effort to try to locate the bird. That's just a handle. That is a handle. I don't think I would help unless I had a very inexperienced dog. I think I would handle because in that moment, I feel the dog is being undisciplined. They didn't put any effort into looking for the bird. They just looked for the most obvious option or maybe the most attractive option. And that was to go back to the flyer. And if that happens, I'm simply going to stop and handle. I'm probably not going to correct. And if I was, I should have been clear on that. You guys shouldn't correct. Remember, this isn't that there's 70 yards difference. There's only, you know, the distance between this gun station and this gun station might be 15 or 20 yards. So it, it's very tight. 
And if I make corrections, I'm just telling the dog to stay completely out of that area. You'll, you'll never get them to do this, Mark. They're simply going to start to do this if you start to make corrections for switching. Um, and then sometimes the dog, well, that pretty much, that pretty much clearly talks about all of the things that can go wrong if the dog is really trying to do this, Mark, and how you would react to them. I think the last thing that can happen, and usually it's more related to the way the handler communicated with the dog that's going, is the dog that leaves the line and is just going long. I think in that situation, if you can recognize that soon enough, I would stop, I would stop the dog, recall the dog without any pressure, light pickup, you know, it's not gonna be any verbal pressure, there's not gonna be any collar pressure, simply here, stop here, and try again. If you need the gunner to stand up, I mean, whenever I pick up, I have a strong mind to, to simplify, especially in a really complex situation. So maybe you need the gunner to stand up. Maybe you need the gunner to make an arm throw. Or maybe you're just gonna try again because maybe you said, you know what, I really didn't communicate right. It's not the dog's fault. If I'm going to help, it's more likely going to be because I did everything I was supposed to do, I pointed the dog correctly, I communicated the right things, and they're just not comfortable doing it. Now I need to help that dog relax or give the dog confidence to at least try to make that mark. And that pretty much covers everything. But I hope what you're reading from this is that when things are very complex, I have to really be judicious in how I react when the dog makes mistakes. I have to do a really good job at communicating what the next task is. Um, otherwise, the dog will fail, not because the dog wasn't making an effort or wasn't prepared, it will fail because I failed. And if there are any questions on this, I'd be happy to take them now. We're at the hour mark. And Baron, you can, uh, I'll come to your question after if you don't mind sticking around for a minute. Uh, and anybody else who wants to stick around for Baron's question, I'm happy to do that too. On this mark, was the which way was the wind direction? Uh, I believe it was pretty that? straight. I believe it was pretty straight downwind. I'm trying to remember. I it, it was, was it wasn't a mark that you would wind, right, Kelsey? Correct. Like, I mean, you could not win this bird, the, especially you could the not dogs that went long. Were, yeah, yeah. You couldn't win it okay, if so you were under the arc, and you couldn't win it if you went past it on. On the on the outside of the mark. That's when you were saying uh, wouldn't send it fat. I was saying, well, it depend on which way the wind was coming. So okay, that makes sense. You know, pushing or pulling. Yeah, like this was a perfectly designed test in my in my book. It was a perfectly designed test that tested so many training. Uh, training topics or so many training areas that you work on with the dog, but it also tested handler skill level and uh, handler's level of effort. Um, it was a be beautiful, this was a beautiful part of the test. The other two to me, the other two marks to me were just, you know, anybody can set up a cheating single and know how to react. But this, this particular, these particular two marks were a beautiful learning opportunity. And that's why I want to share it with you. Um, <clears throat> Kevin, I'm not sure if this is a question or just more of a rambling on this, but um, when we're talking about balance, like I learned so much about handling on this test, like so much, and I'd love another crack at it. But so I feel like I need to set this type of test up regularly to get more confident in my abilities to handle this complex test. But I can't do this with my one dog every day. I can't set up this type of test. So again, I, I think more of my statement is how the heck do I do I practice this type of test without burying my dog every day? You know? Well, I mean, that's, that's why we had the first conversation, you know, about making sure you balance and you don't do this every day, because if you did this every day, your dogs would fall apart. But <clears throat> I think what you can do, Kelsey, is you can set up these types of tests without all of these components in there. Like you can do a mama papa on land without all of these factors um, which will break it down a little bit for your dog or, a, you know, two marks that are slightly different depths where the gunners are kind of in line with each other. You can set that up in a land situation and take some of the training out of it for the dog 
or some of the traps out of it for the dog, making it still, because it's still, this is still a difficult concept on land, even without, um, without all this water, all these decision-making points around the water. It's a very difficult test. I'm going to just erase the board and maybe draw something out. But I think check down bird situations force you to really um, do a good job handling. Um, so it, 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 they're kind of similar. Um, let me just draw a, a couple of different situations. Flyer station. Short, uh, check uh, another gun station here sort of throw an angle back. There's maybe 30 or 30 yards spacing between these two marks. And we have some other bird out in the field somewhere. And maybe it's an out of order flyer. And um, so it's, this is one of those situations. Actually, let me redraw this test. Okay, give me a little bit more information to help. <clears throat> flyer mark. check down bird that's retired. And let's say another gun station out here, thrown this way, stand out, it's the go bird. Okay. So maybe it's shot an out of order flyer shot one, two, three. So in this situation, there's, it is a highly complex situation in that if you, try to push the, if, if, so you've got this mark out of the way, and now you're trying to get the check down bird and it's thrown hip pocket to a flyer. And in training, I would be getting this short bird second. And if you try to push out to the bird, um, where are they gonna, potentially gonna look? At the flyer station. If the dog is, if the dog is, <laughs> This, this mark here is very much like the right hand bird or the slightly longer bird of the previous test in that it's a handler's mark. If you push the dog too much to the left, they're going to go to the flyer. If you are scared of the flyer and you push the dog to the right in order to avoid going to the flyer, your dog can just go right by it this way because you maybe you push the dog away from the gun station. And so now maybe they're looking over here at the standout gun and you pull them from there, from the standout gun this way to try and get them looking at the, uh, to try, try and get them looking at the right destination, but don't push far enough because you're afraid of looking at the fire. What destination are they thinking about potentially? It's certainly not this one because you didn't start at the gunner. You have to start at the gunner or the holding blind if it's there and then work to the bird. So it, it's tests like this where you have really tight situations. Um, particular in particular check down birds um you can work on your handling skills force yourself to do it but make sure you have balance don't go out and hyper focus on anything that is very when you have to sit there online with your dog and work extensively to get them thinking the right things that's a highly stressful activity for a dog highly stressful it's in the orange category okay and if you do that over and over and over again they stop wanting to look out there. Yeah. So be careful. Yeah, you do it, you do a little bit of it and then you, um, you, you, you pull back. It doesn't mean you don't do the concept, but maybe you open it up a little bit more so it's easier for the dog to do the concept and you don't have to putz around as much. Any other questions? Okay. On that mark, that exact mark, so you send your dog to the second, to the, to the check down bird. Now let's say he has a little bit of a hunt, he grabs it, and then you go to send him to the last bird. And what if he, because this happened to me, what if he says, hey, I already picked up that bird, it's not there, and does a no-go? How do you fix a concept? How do you train for a concept like that? So uh, two things, if I get a no-go, a lot of times I do want to force, but I think that this is a complex situation and maybe I would, maybe I would handle it a little bit differently than I would have maybe in the past, but I would say, Baron, you take a couple of steps toward the mark and you try again. 
Right. Well, what I did was up. I used a back and I got them there, but but it it happened to me two weekends in a row where they were sort of in line, mm -hmm. and he had a hunt on the, the almost this exact setup, and he had a hunt on this middle bird, and he came back with it, and when I well, went to it, send him to the left bird. A... It could be a three bird. It could be a three bird test that he's he doesn't have enough experience doing. Like, how often are you setting up a wide open triple and running it as a triple? And I say wide open. When I say wide open, I'm talking about you know yeah. you set up a, a marking test where the dog can't be anything but success, successful. They don't have to be short, but there can't be any factors. And you have to do your job pointing it in the right direction, communicating the right things. And, um, you can't, you know, if it's wide open, there are no concepts and they're relatively equidistant. They're all, there are no short marks. Um, if you do that, I think that's probably more likely where your problem is. You're not giving your dog enough no, no triples, triples. Uh, where you have three guns in the field and you throw the triple, but you make sure that that triple is so easy. Your dog can't fail. If you're trying to do the, do a triple in a complex situation, your dog is going to fail. It's going to fall into some trap, potentially lead to correction. And so you've done nothing to instill the confidence or develop, uh, develop the, um, the skills necessary to get that dog to, to, to do a triple. So that, yep. that's the, where yeah, that's what I was know. thinking, but people think say any train on singles. That. Well, we do a lot of singles, we do a lot of doubles, but what you fail to do, what you're failing to do, and it's not, I'm just identifying something, it's not a criticism. Right. What no. you're failing to do is, is cover all of the necessary areas of training and doing triples, putting together triples in training is that piece of the puzzle that gives the dogs the confidence to run a more complex triple at an event. Gotcha. Thank you. Did you have another question about the oh, uh, on the uh, <clears throat> yes on uh, so let's say you're training on and you put a complex in it it's going into red let's say a poison bird or a point so uh, and you can see your dog stressing out do you stop doing that or do you simplify it by moving up or spreading the marks out? how do you handle the stress where you teach your dog the concept and teach him to get through this to handle stress? Yeah. Well, that happens occasionally where we set up a test for a dog and we've thrown them into the deep end of the pool and they're not equipped or they're not in the right frame of mind to do the test. It happens to all of us. And, uh, -huh. uh you, you know, what's important is to quickly recognize that uh, your dog is, uh, drowning and to find an exit strategy. You know, if, if you're doing a blind, for instance, a water blind, and uh, you start handling and it's not going well and it looks like your dog's being undisciplined and then you, you make several corrections and the dog's not responding appropriately to corrections and still, you know, perhaps trying to get out. Um, at that point, you've got to say, whoa, whoa, hold on a second. I think I might, I might have overstepped here. I might have asked my dog to do too much. And so now you've got to come up with an exit strategy. How do I get this finished? Or how do I get to a point in the lesson where I can exactly. stop? And so it may be asking your buddy, hey, could you run out? Could you jump on the bike, run out, and just run onto that spit and throw a bird? Go, hey, 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 and throw a bird. So that you sort of, in that moment, you explain to the dog, hey, I need you to go in this direction. Um, and you're helping the dog with enough, you know, you're giving the dog enough help that they can go, oh, that's what he wants. And you can just get the dog to the bird and you, you quit running the blind. You're obviously, you're just gonna say, whoa, I, I'm not gonna even try to get that dog to the blind anymore. I need to just get out of this without doing any damage because that's what you'll do. If you force the issue, you're gonna do damage. Okay, great. That was a good answer. Okay. Uh, I'll take one more question. If anybody has any other questions, if not, we'll call it here. Anybody have a question? I've got one, but I've asked a lot. So if anyone else has. No, go one. ahead, Kelsey. Go ahead. <laughs> so we're balancing hard days and easy days and monitoring these dogs for signs of stress. 
Um, ideally, where would time off fit in for you? Because I know that this is my huge downfall because I like to train. Yep. <laughs> yeah, that's <with laughs> not many just other people <laughs> out there. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, <laughs> not just every week, but I mean, what, what should our year look like or our season? What would you want us to do? Yeah, I, I would like you to give the dogs two days off minimum. I know that sounds like a lot because I said minimum. And you might say, what, three days? I would rather see you get more in, in one day than train every day. But I, I would say, you know, probably a, in, in reality for a pro, let's just talk about a pro situation. In reality for a pro, there are many days when they can only get one, maybe two tests in. So they, don't have the ability to do a lot of things in one day. So they might train six days a week, but here you are in a small training group where you're training by yourself and you can easily get three tests in, in a day. And so if you're getting three tests in, in a day, that doesn't mean you train for six days, getting three tests in a day, your dogs will burn out and they will physically break down. And so you were hoping for that, you know, to have your dog running until they're, you know, into their maybe nine or 10 but you end up having a dog that, you know, starting to fail at seven and eight physically. And this is, you know, you, some of you people know Janelle Appel and who I have so much respect for, uh, who's sports medicine vet. And she made it clear to me during when I was a pro, if, if you don't give these dogs adequate time off, they're going to break down and uh, you won't have a dog left. So you may end up with a blown cruciate and you, you just lost six months of a career in terms of getting the dog. Uh, surgery and rehab and maybe 12 to $15,000. Uh, so it doesn't, it, at the end of the day, you're, you're not going to be any further ahead because now you didn't have the dog, you know, still running at eight, or, sorry, at nine and maybe 10, you, you had to, you know, put the dog uh, on the couch at eight. And I don't want that to happen to you guys. She made it clear that dogs need to repair. They need off time to repair those micro tears that happen to tendons, ligaments, muscles, and it's when we don't allow for a rest period that those micro tears turn into bigger tears. There's no time for repair. And then those bigger tears turn into huge problems. Bicep tendon, uh, 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 groin muscle, pull, uh, and a cruciate are you know, some of the most common. And... Um, once they happen, it's not only did you might have to have surgery and you rehab the dog, then you're managing that problem for the rest of their career and you just lose so much time that way. So two to three days off a week, cram a lot of training in on the days that you do train if possible. Um, you know, she said that to me, don't be afraid to go out and do more tests on the days that you are training, but give them the time off and conditioning is what you can do, you know, on some of those days and conditioning is simply walking on flat level ground at a trot and the dogs are restrained from running they're harnessed so if you're conditioning your dog if you're not doing that you're not conditioning your dog you're just allowing your dog to run around and of course if they're running around now you're not allo allowing time uh, for rest and repair but you know taking the conditioning them for and i'm not going to give you numbers janelle's the expert in that area but let's say she maybe kelsey you know a little bit better than me because i don't to talk to her but 20 minutes uh maybe 20 minutes of roading at a, at a at a trot gentle trot is what she suggests uh is it once a week kelsey um yeah once or twice a week is what she kind of was season dependent and i think she would like a long water conditioning day and a, a that's longer right conditioning day. Yeah. yeah. If, and I forget the numbers on that. So she would like them conditioned on land and in the water. Yeah. If these dogs are conditioned, they're less likely to get injured as well um, because they have the stamina to get through the test we're asking them to do. Uh, they're not tired and maybe uh, tripping and out of breath. And, you know, I, I mean, just, you just, it makes sense If the dog is better conditioned, less chance they're going to get injured. And if they're conditioned and you have a 25 to 30 minute water test and the last bird is the big swim that's 300 yards, well, they're not going to come back to the line after the second bird going, <laughs> you want me to do what? You know, um, they're going to come back and they're going to be, you know, just 
maybe just some, some breathing, but nothing heavy. And they're like, okay, where's the next bird? So conditioning, it, I mean, success again, isn't just about getting training in. It, re it revolves around a whole number of things that we do for our dogs. Conditioning, uh, we'll call it just mental maintenance, the stuff that I talked about in the first conversation, managing their mental state, and then the training that we do. And I think I'm just going to end it there, guys. And it's been great hanging out with you. I hope you got something out of it. I hope it didn't ramble on too much. And uh, we'll do it again. I know, uh, Kelly, you want to talk about the whistle, but we can do that either together ourselves or we can do it um, in another, another webinar call. Yeah, so I was just going to ask, Kevin, um, do, are, do you have one? Are you thinking of getting another one of these scheduled? Well, we can do that. Soon? And if, if you have some topics you'd like me to cover, I, I encourage you all to send me in, um, send them to me or talk to me or send me a text message and 